Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian from the Royal International Air Tattoo at RAF Fairford in the United Kingdom outside London. And we have with us Lieutenant General Chris Bogdan, the Program Executive Officer of the Joint Strike Fighter Program, which is the big star of the show. Sir, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Vago. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, you've been working this program 24-7 uh, for four years now as the, as, the, as the PEO. Talk to us a little bit about what this day means, but also what the challenges ahead are for the program that you're focused on. Yeah, this is an important week for the program, for the UK, and all of our partners. Um, we've been working really, really hard to mature the airplane and, and the weapon system, and this is an opportunity for the people of the UK to see the fruits of, of that labor. Um, we tried to come two years ago, and, and it wasn't in the cards, so this is kind of a I will return kind of thing for, for the UK, and we promised we'd be here, and we are, and this is an opportunity to show um, all of our European partners uh, how good this airplane is today and how good it's going to become. Um, what are some of the challenges you're focused on uh, next? I mean, obviously it was important to get these jets here, especially the number that are here, five, which is, which is really a powerful statement. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about what the things you're focused on, because once, once you get back uh, to, to even your hotel room tonight, there's going to be a stack of work that you're going to have to do. Yeah. Um, we, we've got a lot of things going on at once. Um, one of the things that we're concerned about is we're, we're within the last two years of ending the bigger development program. So my team is focused on how to close out uh, a $50 billion development program that started in 2001 and how do you transition that to a follow-on modernization program that will keep the airplane relevant for decades to come uh, as the threat improves. Second thing we're, uh, we're keeping our eye on is we have a huge production ramp rate coming up in the next few years. This year we're going to deliver about 53 airplanes. Uh, next year that jumps up to over 60. The year after that it's almost 100 and then the year after that it goes up to 120. So in the next four years you'll see almost a tripling of the production ramp rate. We have to make sure that all the supply chain is ready for that. We have to make sure that all the fielded units that are going to be accepting all these new airplanes are ready to accept them with their infrastructure at their airfields and the support equipment is ready to, to take them on. Um, the third thing we're doing right now is we're standing up a, a global sustainment enterprise. So we're replicating many of the capabilities to repair the airplane that we have put in place in North America. We're going to replicate that in Europe and replicate that in the Pacific so that we have a global enterprise so that any F-35 anywhere in the world can re be repaired in that region without having to go back, uh, say, to the, to the United States or North America. Um, those, are, those are the big programmatic things we're doing. We're always focused on affordability and driving the cost of the airplane down and driving the cost of how much it costs to operate and maintain the airplane down. So we're, we have a bit pretty busy a uh, few uh, years ahead of us. I, I want to talk to you about sustainment and taking costs on the airplane, but I have to ask you, the big question obviously is Britain's decision, uh, the vote to leave, obviously it's up to Parliament ultimately to make the decision and there are a lot of negotiations, but the British pound has already lost value, so there are those who say that the, those airplanes just got 15% more expensive just in a few weeks. Um, from a cost and currency standpoint, what are, are there mechanisms that exist in the program to sort of attenuate currency impacts uh, in the event that there is a big financial crisis and causes a big perturbation in, in exchange rates, for example? So, so first, um, uh, you have to recognize that the supply chain that builds this airplane is global. Um, so we get pieces and parts and manufacturing from all over the world. 15% of this airplane comes from the UK. So anytime there's a fluctuation in the, in the exchange rates between the dollar and any of our partners' currencies, um, we have to watch that very carefully. Um, we do have in our contracts when we sign those with Lockheed and when Lockheed subsequently signs those contracts with suppliers around the world, um, uh, provisions to ensure that the currency exchange rates don't dominate um, the price in one way or another. Uh, we basically hedge in, in some instances. Um, and it goes both ways with those ex currency exchange rates. While it is true that because the pound has lost value, uh, an F-35 may cost less um, for the UK to buy it, but all the suppliers that provide parts to the United States from the UK, those parts are now cheaper for us, which in turn reduces the price of the airplane. So there's somewhat of a balancing effect there. Um, we watch that carefully with our partners, uh, and, and we try and ensure um, that uh, any kind of change in the global markets when it comes to, to currency don't affect the program that much. 
cost reduction, uh, as you mentioned, for both acquisition and sustainment are top priorities for the program and for you, and, and we've spoken a lot about that, you've spoken a lot about that. What, but are, what are the limits? What are the targets, but what are the realistic limits as to how much cost can be taken out of such a sophisticated aircraft? And also from a capability standpoint, this aircraft is not the previous generation. It offers you quantum leaps in capability, so there may be higher operating costs getting associated. What are sort of the metrics and the realistic targets here that folks should intellectually start to get comfortable with for a, an air, aircraft of this capability? Right. Um, so on the cost front there, we have said since about 2012 that we're looking at a, a cost target for the production of the airplane in 2019. Uh, to be around $85 million for an A model, which includes the airframe, the engine, and all the fees we have to pay industry to build the airplane in 2019 dollars. That's just our first target. We believe as we finally get up to full production rate, which is over 170 airplanes a year, that we will go well below $85 million an airplane, and, and we're looking for an airplane in the, in the $70 million range. Our measure of merit in that regard is we want to be a fifth generation airplane at fourth generation prices um, when it comes to procuring the airplane. Um, so relative to, to those limits, eventually when you get out into the mid-20s and beyond, when you reach full rate production, uh, you're not going to see the dramatic um, price reductions that maybe you're seeing today. Um, but, but we hope beyond $85 million, we continue for many years to drive the price down. On the sustainment side of things, since 2011, when we started really accurately measuring how much it costs to operate and maintain this airplane, we've taken about 9% out of the cost of the airplane. We in think, real terms. In real terms. We think there's another 20% to go. Our target is that we want to reduce the ONS operating and sustainment costs of this airplane about 30% from where they were in 2012. Uh, what does that mean today in, in real numbers? Um, one of the measures we use or we look at is the cost per flying hour of the airplane. Um, today for an A model, the cost per flying hour um, is projected over the next few years to be somewhere around $30,000. Um, just, just to give you an idea of a comparison, if you did an apples to apples with an F-16 um, Block 50 airplane, it today maybe will be between twenty-five and twenty-six thousand dollars an the hour. Fully loaded cost, the fully which is loaded a cost. Way of calculating. Right. You, you, you've got to really do apples to apples there. Um, we think there's at least another fifteen percent or twenty percent out of that cost per flying hour that over the next five to ten years we can get out. Um, when Alice becomes more mature, when we refine our maintenance standards, when we finally do get the global supply chain built um, such that we're getting parts repaired quicker, easier, and cheaper, um, we, do, we do honestly believe that we can get 30%, uh, which is a 20% on top of the 10 we've already taken out on the airplane. Um, the ALICE system obviously is a key part of the sustainment of the aircraft. It's the digitized, the autonomic logistics uh, information system which manages all of the, the sort of sustainment and support of the aircraft. There have been some challenges with it. It has interfered with training as well as uh, the development of the aircraft a little bit. You've been focused on that issue. Are you satisfied you have a fix identified and when does that kind of come into effect? Because folks even here at the show in briefing it have said, look, we, th there are some things we've had to work around in order to be able to Right. There, there's two aspects. Um, to Alice that we're concentrating on right now. And, and we've taken um, the fielding and development of those two aspects um, quite separately. So on the capability side of things, um, things that we need to give the warfighter, um, for example, the ability to do all of Alice engine maintenance work inside of Alice, integrating the engine inside of Alice, or the fact that all, some of the parts on the airplane have life limits, and we want to be able to automatically track those life limits to make sure that we don't overfly certain parts. Those capabilities are coming in the next big increment of ALICE we call ALICE 202. We've had some trouble. Um, ALICE 202 um, should have been done this summer. Uh, the life limited parts portion of it will probably be done in September. We'll probably have to wait until about November to get the engine integration part in there. So that's, from a capability standpoint, we're slightly behind getting Alice to the field with those capabilities. 
But what we separated from that capability development was the ability to, to decrease the workarounds that the maintainer has to do today. Those little annoyances that, that when he goes to a certain screen on Alice that he's got to wait a minute for the screen to come up or that a different screen comes up. The so-called punching it in twice. Right. So we've taken that set of development and we've divorced it from the bigger capabilities because what we've been able to do is every two to three months we can put out there a new version of Alice a new increment of Alice that, that takes care of a lot of those workarounds. That has been hugely successful. The warfighters and the maintainers have told us, you've got to keep doing that because yes, we want the bigger capabilities, but what we really want is all of those workarounds and all those nuances, uh, and, uh, th those nuisance things that, we're, that, that, that are keeping us back from really you know, getting the availability we want out of the airplane. You got to fix those too. And we've been doing that. We've put two of them out already. We've got another two in the next six months coming out. So big capability and fixing those small things come together and you get a better owl system. Um, I know you've got to go, so I have two very quick questions to ask you. Question one, Canada, uh, obviously partner nation in the program, still a partner nation, but debating whether or not to go with a different aircraft. Uh, there was going to be an open competition when the Trudeau government came in. Then there was a rumor going around they were going to sole source the F-18s, and now it looks like it's back to an open competition. How do you feel that's going to go? You guys won Denmark, which was a very, very big win, very hotly contested. How's it going to go for Canada, do you think, ultimately? Yeah, so uh, from our perspective, clearly the Canadian government will have patience with the Canadian government. They're doing their due diligence, and you would expect any nation and any government to do that. What we're, what we're encouraged by is the fact that they recognize that they don't want to take a long time to do this because of that capability gap that they see coming down the road with their older fighters. So we encourage them to move as quickly as they can on that. We're also encouraged by the fact that what we are hearing is they will look across a broad spectrum of airplanes uh, to include the F-35. And we think if they look across a broad spectrum of airplanes, um, then Canada will make a, a good choice. We feel confident that the F-35 is in a good position there, but that will depend on the requirements uh, that Canada um, lays on their decision making. And, and the role in the program depends on whether they actually buy the aircraft, right? There is maybe a reduced role for Canadian industry if they're not. It, it, it has been it has been it has been an unwritten rule that um, as part of as part of the benefits of being a partner and buying the airplane that industrial participation came with that um, if you choose not to be a partner you choose not to buy the airplane then we would have to go back to the rest of the partnership and industry and discuss what all alternatives there were and and quick question this is sort of in your purview but not the jet uh, is going to be capable of seamless data exchanges you're proving that in exercises and in training but the challenge, as Major General Cobra Harigian, Jeff Harigian, uh, briefed the, F the Air Force's F-35 integration uh, uh, chief, said, look, the national protocols and policies are an impediment to smoothly moving this intel data. How long do you think it's going to take to get that sorted so that the policies are in line with the technology of the airplane? Yeah, th this is less a technological issue because the airplane, as you said, is very adept at passing information across not only F-35s, but to many other platforms and many other places. So it is not an issue of, of technology. This is an issue of policy, because for an airplane to be as smart as, as it is, and the F-35 is a very smart airplane, you need a lot of intel going into that airplane. Um, we share some, we don't share other pieces of intel all across the world with all of our allies lining that up so that our partners and our allies can get what they need to fly the airplane as well as protecting U.S. information is a difficult challenge. Um, I will tell you Mr. Kendall, De Deputy Secretary Work, um, all the people, policy folks in, in, in OSD, State Department, all recognize that this is an issue that we have to deal with and, and we've got the forums in place to start working through that for the partners and our allies to make sure that when we give them the airplane, they have the best intelligence they can have so that the airplane can be maximized. Sir, thanks very much for spending time with us on this special few days. Thanks, Father. I really appreciate it. Um, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks.